Hello everyone, this is Dr. Webb. In this video, we're going to be taking a closer look at the size of a Galois group. How many elements can be in a Galois group? Um, so, a little bit of a trigger warning at the start. Um, the results in this video are a little bit technical and a little bit involved, um, but uh, really they have some really clever, wonderful ideas and we're going to see these uh, pop up again in the future some. So it's worth taking a, a good close look at what's going on. So let's do a quick review of, of what we've seen uh, so far about Galois groups. And so the Galois group of a, of a field extension, what does that mean? So for a field extension L over K, the Galois group L over K is the set of K automorphisms of L. And so that means a k-automorphism of L is an isomorphism from L to itself that fixes all the elements of k, that doesn't move any of the elements of k. Uh, this Galois group, Galois group of L over k, forms a group under functional composition. And if it is a finite extension, so if, if the degree of L over k is less than infinity, then we were able to prove that the Galois group has to be finite as well. So finite extensions have to be, have to have finite Galois groups. But that's all that we've been able to say so far about how big the Galois group actually is. So let's be a bit more specific. So the goal of this video is to prove this theorem. Uh, if you have a finite e extension L over K, then the size of the Galois group has to be less than or equal to the degree of the extension. There can't be more elements in the Galois group than there is the dimension of the vector space over k. Okay, so let's look at some examples and see, and see how this fits in. So we've talked some about quadratic extensions, and so this is where you would join the square root of a non-square integer, um, and these are always degree 2, and there's always two elements of the Galois group. The elements of the Galois group are going to be the identity. Let's make that, let's make this a reasonable size. Sorry. You're going to have the identity. And you're going to have this element, let's call it sigma. And what sigma does is it sends square root of n to minus square root of n. And then it sends minus square root of n back to square root of n. So it just flops. Uh, square root of n and minus square root of n. And that's it, because square root of n has to be sent to uh, another conjugate, another root of the same polynomial, and the only other root of it is minus square root of n. Uh, another one that we've talked a bit about is that if you look at q adjoin the cube root of 2 over the rationals, um, that has order 3, but the Galois group is trivial. There's, the Galois group only has one element, the identity because this extension doesn't have any other roots of the minimal polynomial for cube root of 2. And so this is a case where the Galois group is less than the degree of the extension. So we've already seen both equal or less. Um, but if you go and you also adjoin uh, the, cube root of the cube root of unity, omega, and so then q adjoin the cube root of 2 and omega, now is degree 6 over the rationals, and its Galois group also has order 6. So this is another place where the uh, order of the Galois group is equal to the degree of the extension. So the main tool that we're going to need to prove this theorem is what's called Dedekind's lemma. And so Dedekind's lemma, this, this, this is a technical lemma, but it's, it's important and it's useful. And, and actually the, the form that I'm giving to you here is not as general as, as the actual version that if you say, you know, look this up on Wikipedia, looked up Dedekind's Lemma, it would give you actually, uh, this is true in a broader context, but I'm just focusing in on the, the specific context that we're looking at. And so what Dedekind's Lemma says is that, uh, if you have sigma 1 through sigma n are the Galois group of L over k, and again we're thinking about L over k as being a finite extension, then the only solution, a1 through an in L, such that 
a1 times sigma 1 of x plus all the way up to a n plus sigma n of x equal to 0 is true for all x in L simultaneously is if all of these coefficients a1 through a n, so all of these coefficients a1 through a n are 0. So in other words, that if you have a1 through a n non-zero, then you can't get this linear combination equal to zero for all x and l. Okay, so this is, this is a little bit of a mouthful. So one thing that's important to note is that it is crucially important that we're talking that it has to be true for all x and l simultaneously without changing the a1s through the a-ns. Right? This is not true for some fixed L, or even if we have a handful of fixed L, you can do this. Um, we are trying to, we are forcing this to be true for all X and L, right? And so then that's when it can't happen. Um, and so often this is described as being, as uh, saying that the automorphisms of Galois group or the elements of the Galois group are linearly independent in in this way, um, that, that sort of taking a linear combination of them over L uh, won't give you something that's equal to zero for everything in the field extension simultaneously. And so the way that we're going to approach this is by contradiction. So here's how it goes. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to note is that if there was such, such a linear combination, so we're doing this by, by contradiction, so we're assuming that there is, then that linear combination is going to have to have at least three of the AIs be non-zero. Okay, and so why is this true? Well, let's suppose otherwise. Let's suppose we could do it with two or less, right? And so without loss of generality, let's just assume that it's, after relabeling, that it's the first two. And so we have some a1 times sigma 1 of x plus a2 times sigma 2 of x is equal to 0 for all x and l simultaneously. Okay, So that means we can pick anything in l and plug this in, and it would be true. Well, why don't we pick just one, the unit, the, uh, the multiplicative identity? What happens if we plug it in? Well, sigma of any of the sigma i's of 1 is going to just be 1. And so this instantly breaks down to just saying that a1 plus a2 has to equal 0. Well, then that would mean that a1 has to equal minus a2. Okay. Well, now let's pick some other element, x and l, and let's pick it specifically such that sigma 1 of x is not equal to sigma 2 of x. And we can guarantee this to be true because if we can't find such an x, then that means that sigma 1 and sigma 2 agree for all values of x, so they aren't really different automorphisms. They aren't really different elements of the Galois group. So the fact that they are different elements of the Galois group means that there has to be some x value in which they disagree. And so let's pick one of those uh, values of L, plug that in, so, if sigma 1 of x is not equal to sigma 2 of x, that means that sigma 1 of x minus sigma 2 of x can't equal 0. Well, if we take this line and then multiply it, the whole thing, by a1, we get that a1 of sigma 1 of x minus a1 of sigma 2 of x can equal 0. But, minus a1, this is the same thing as plus a2. Right? Because we know that a1 is equal to minus a2. And so this would mean that a1 of sigma 1 of x plus a2 of sigma 2 of x is not equal to 0. And that contradicts that this is a solution for all x and l. So this means that there has to be at least three terms in this linear combination, in this linear dependence. Okay, so now, now that we know that there can't be only two terms, there has to be at least three, now we're going to think about taking all the solutions, we're going to take the solution that uses the least number of non-zero AIs, right? So we have a lower bound, we know that it has to be more than two, and so looking at all these possibilities, we're going to take the one that uses the least. And so um, by relabeling, we're just going to assume that those least 
those non-zero ones are going from A1 through AK. So each of these, let's make a plus sign there, each of these AIs here are not equal to zero. Yeah, so where A1 through AK are all non-zero, and we know that there are at least three of these K. Okay, so with that loss of generality, we can assume that this first element of the Galois group, sigma 1, is the identity. Why can we do that? Well, suppose that it's not. Well, then we could just apply sigma 1 inverse to the whole combination. What are we going to get? Well, that's going to give us the identity for the first term. It's going to, for each of the AIs, it's going to take sigma 1 inverse of them, but these are still going to be elements of L. These are still each elements of L. Um, and in particular, since the A1 through AK are non-zero, that means that sigma 1 inverse of them have to still be non-zero, right? So this is still a solution using, a, uh, using K non-zero coefficients uh, that still will work for all X. So this is just really applying sigma 1 inverse to this is really just saying that we can relabel these Gawa elements and get something else. Okay, so we can just assume that if sigma 1 is not the identity, we can just do this and relabel everything and get it back to looking like this up here. Okay, now we're going to choose some element y in L such that sigma k of y is not equal to y. Okay, and this is possible to do because we know that sigma 1 is the identity, so that means that sigma k is not the identity. So there has to be at least one element of L that's sent to somewhere else. Okay, so this means that for all L, if we take basic equation we have, we can say multiply all the terms by Y, and that's still going to give us a linear combination that's equal to zero. So one thing we can do is just multiply the equation by Y. Another thing we can do is that since Y, and we take any X in L, the product of y and x are going to be an L. That means that we could uh, that we could plug yx in to each of the elements of the Galois group and have this still be true. And then using the fact that sigma i of yk of yx, we can break this up to sigma i of y times sigma i of x. We can break this up, and so this is what we've done over on this side, broken them all up like this. And so we still have the sigma i's of x for each of these in here. Now look at these two. So now these are two different linear combinations that are getting us zero, and they have the exact same first term. They both start with a1yx, a1yx. So what can we do? Well, let's subtract the first equation from the second and cancel these first two terms out. And so the, we're going to cancel the a1yx, and what are we left with? Well, we're going to have a2 sigma 2 of y minus y, so the a2 sigma 2 of y is coming from there, and then the y sigma 2 is coming from there, and repeat this for all the other sigmas. On the right hand side we're just subtracting 0 from 0, so it's still 0, and so now this now has one less term than it did before. This is now k minus 1 terms long. So here it is again, as we said, it's now k minus 1 terms, and in this last term, remember we said that sigma k of y is not equal to y, and so this last term has to be non-zero. So it can't be that each of these, that we've canceled off all of these by subtracting these two, because we've guaranteed that the last one's going to be non-zero. Well, this is going to hold for any x and l. You know, by the way we constructed it, wasn't we weren't using, we fixed a y, but we were using any x in here, right? And so since sigma k 
of y is not equal to y, the last term has to be non-zero for any x in L. And so that would mean that this is a non-trivial solution, but it had one less term than what we said the minimal number was. Right? So this contradicts that the minimal number of non-zero terms we needed was k. And this completes the proof. Right? So that gives us our finished proof right there. Sort of another way to think about it is let's say that k was k can't be 3 because going through the same process we'd be able to show that really we only needed 2 but we proved that 2 doesn't work right so then it can't be 4 because if it was 4 then we could cancel one off and get back down to 3 but we just proved that 3 doesn't work right and so you can kind of think about that this is kind of giving an inductive way of thinking about it in that if there was a solution you could always break it down to a solution with less terms. And that's going to lead to a contradiction because we've already proved that there has to be some minimal number of terms in there. Okay, now let's go to our big theorem, um, showing that the, the size of the Galois group, the order of the Galois group, has to be less than or equal to the degree of the extension. Okay, and so again, we're going to prove this by contradiction. So we're going to suppose that the, that the Galois group has more elements than the degree of the extension. So let's uh, hammer down some terminology. So the Galois group, uh, we're going to say the elements of the Galois group are sigma 1 through sigma n. Uh, and we're going to say that for the extension L over k, we're going to say that it has basis alpha 1 through alpha m. So alpha 1 through alpha m are elements of L that give a basis for it over k. Okay, so, the, so there are n things in the Galois group, and there are m things in the basis, and we're supposing that m is strictly less than n. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a matrix out of this. And if you look in the matrix, in the columns, these all have sigma 1. So the columns are really in terms of the elements of the Galois group, while the rows are in terms of the elements of the basis. So in this, in this matrix, um, in the... Uh, ith row and jth column is going to be sigma i is going to be sigma j of alpha i ith row and jth column ith row is going to be alpha i jth column is going to be sigma j and so sigma j of alpha i is sitting there in the ith row and jth column. So every combination of element of the Galois group and element of the basis happens exactly once in this matrix. So in this matrix, it has m rows for the m elements of the basis and n columns for the n elements of the Galois group. And remember that n, the number of columns, n is greater than the number of rows. And so that means that the rank has to be less than n because the rank can't be any bigger than the, than the number of rows in this case because there's more columns than rows. Okay, and so the column rank has to be no bigger than m. Well, if we have more columns than the rank, then that means that there must be some non-trivial linear dependence between the columns, right? So what would a non-trivial linear column... Uh, linear dependence look like? Well, it'd be a1 times the column sigma1 alpha1 through sigma1 alpha m plus dot 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 a n times the column sigma n alpha1 through sigma n alpha m has to equal zeros all the way down. Well, now let's kind of break that up and think about it sort of one row at a time. That would give us that we have some a1 through all a n, not all zero, such that for any alpha j in the basis, so this is kind of looking across the jth row in that uh, linear combination of, of the columns, 
we'd have that a1 sigma 1 alpha j plus dot 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 plus a n sigma n alpha j is equal to zero. And this is true for all the basis elements alpha j, simultaneously not changing the a1 through the an. Those stay the same irregardless of the alpha j's. Well, this is going to end up contradicting Dedekind's law. So why is that true? Well, let's take any x in L. So x is in L, so it can be written as a linear combination of the basis. So we have some b1 through bm in K, such that x is equal to b1 alpha 1 plus dot 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 bm alpha m. Okay. Well, so what is sigma i of x going to be? Well, this is going to be sigma i of b1 alpha 1 plus bm alpha m, right? But now we can distribute this sigma i, b1 times sigma i alpha i plus sigma i bm times sigma i alpha m. And then furthermore, the b1 through bm are in k, and sigma i is an element of the Galois group. Sigma i is in the Galois group of L over k. So k is the base field, so it fixes everything in k. And so really this is just b1 sigma i of alpha i plus bm sigma i of alpha m, right? And so alpha i of x, we can break it up into it's just the b1, the bj's times alpha i of alpha j. That should be alpha 1 there. That should be alpha 1. So what happens if we now consider plugging x into this linear combination? Well, if we plug in x equals b1 alpha 1 da, 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 up to bm alpha m into each of these, we can then distribute the alpha i's the same as we saw before, and then rearrange them to get the same, all the alpha 1 terms together, all the alpha 2 terms together, all the alpha m terms together. Out of those, we'll be able to pull out for alpha 1, we'll be able to pull out a b1. For alpha 2, we'll be able to pull out a b2. Up to alpha m, we'll be able to pull out a bm. And then what we saw before is that coming from the linear combination on that matrices, each of these are equal to 0. So it'd be b1 times 0 plus b2 times 0 plus b3 times 0, da, 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 up to bm times 0. And so it's a bunch of zeros added together, and so we'd have to get zero. And so this linear combination would have to work for all x in L, because it works for all elements on, of the basis. And so that gives us our question. So that can't possibly happen. So n can't be bigger than m. We can't get this linear combination of this linear dependence between the columns of that matrix. And so it must be that n is less than or equal to m. And that finishes the proof. Okay. So in review, big result from this is that if you have a finite field extension, then the number of elements of the Galois group is less than or equal to the degree of the extension. So looking ahead, um, we're going to see that the extensions where these actually are equal, where the number of elements of the Galois group is equal to the degree of the extension, have particularly nice properties. And so we're going to give these a special name. We'll give them a special label. And we're going to say that if L over K is a finite field extension such that the number of elements in the Galois group equal the degree of the extension, then we're going to say that L over K is what is called a Galois extension. Okay, and so keep an eye out for this in the future. 
um, Galois extensions are going to be particularly nice. So we actually want the number of the elements in the Galois group to equal the degree of the extension. That is all for this video. I will see you again soon.